Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, and we'll be reading from verses number 1. But before we go into that, I just want to give a, some brief introduction. The book of Acts, chapter 15, opens with a visitation from preacher, of, of some preachers from uh, Antioch, uh, from, of, of, of visitation of some preachers from Jerusalem to Antioch. Okay? Now, these men, they were, though they were preachers, though these men were, you know, from a place where the apostles were ministering on a weekly basis, they were there, they heard the apostles preach. Though these men recognized, they were recognized as teachers in the house of the Almighty God, the interesting thing about these individuals that were visiting Antioch was that they preached a different gospel. They were preaching a completely different gospel. These men were preaching a gospel that had these additional layers attached to it. These men were preaching a gospel that had a condition, an added condition, you know, that, that, was, that, that is a part of it. They were preaching a gospel which, with what I call an added stipulation. And what was that added stipulation? These men were telling the Gentiles that they were preaching to that in order for them to be truly saved, they have to be circumcised. They were teaching that in order for these particular Gentiles, these people who are not Jews, in order for them to be accepted into the body of Christ, they had to obey the laws of Moses. Okay? Now, these preachers from Jerusalem, now, this, to them, the stipulations appear to be reasonable. The stipulations appear to be insignificant. They thought that this particular stipulation will probably look good and will make them acceptable to the religious authority. It made them look better in the eyes of the world. But they failed to realize that their particular stipulation was a problem. Okay? This little stipulation was a problem because, number one, it was contrary to the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that these are the same people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said they will compass the whole world looking for convert. But when they brought the convert in, they will turn that convert twice the child of hell. So they were saying that the same people, that the same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ criticized the Pharisees for were the same thing that these people wanted all the, the, the Gentiles to believe in order to be recognized as a true born again individual. So what they were teaching was problematic because it was contrary to the teaching of Christ. It was a problem because it was contrary to the Christ, you know, to the Christian lifestyle. It was contrary to it was it was a problem because it was contrary to the message of salvation. The Bible tells us many of us know this verse of the scripture by heart. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. In that verse of the scripture, you will see the Bible did not say, Whosoever is circumcised and then obey the laws of Moses will become saved. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what Lord Jesus Christ taught. But this is what these people were teaching. And Paul and Barnabas recognized this particular problem. And the Bible tells us that they recognized it because you know, they were able to see that the teachings that these people were bringing was different from the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. They could see that it was an error in the, in the, in the core of the message of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they confronted these people. They challenged them. And now you understand that if anybody is teaching something that is contrary to the scripture and you challenge them, you know you are looking for trouble. Immediately they challenged them, there was a problem. And the Bible said there was a lot of friction between the two of them, between Paul, Barnabas, and this particular group of preachers. They said they had a lot of confrontation. And because they were both preaching the word of God, they were both preaching the gospel, they said, okay, instead of us fighting, let's do this. Let's go to the people who actually ate and dined with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the apostles. Let's go to the leaders of the church and table this matter and let them resolve it for us. And that's where we're going to pick the story from. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, reading from verse number 1. The Bible says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, saying, Unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputes with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders about this question. In verse number 4, the Bible says that when they, had, when they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God has done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the laws of Moses. Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. Now from this verse of the scripture, 
We see that the church leaders at Jerusalem received the delegation and called the meeting of the church council and to resolve this particular issue. If you read that verse of the scripture continuously, the Bible tells us that Paul, that Peter was the one that spoke, the first to speak. And Peter was saying, why do you want to add additional burdens into the heart of somebody when God has not added that particular burden? Why are you telling them to do something that God has not asked them to do? Paul the Apostle and Barnabas stood up and they told the same story. They gave the testimonies and the miracles that has already been happening in the midst of the Gentiles. Even without the circumcision and the obedience to the laws of Moses. And then James finally spoke up. James just told them, he said, you do not have to trouble the new convert with these new laws. And by the time you get to verse number 22 of that act, of Acts chapter 15, the Bible tells us that, they now, the, the council in Jerusalem reached a verdict. Verse number 22 says, And it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter to them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren to the brethren who are, in, who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandments. See, it seems good, it seems good to us, being assembled with one accord, to, choose, to send chosen men to you, which are beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have, risen, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by the word of mouth. For it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than those necessary, that ye abstain from the things offered to idols, from blood and from things strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these things, you will do well. In other words, the church is saying that there is no additional requirement for salvation other than your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't ask you to do any other thing. We are not saying that you must obey the laws of Moses. We are not saying that you must be circumcised. We are only saying that you must maintain a life of purity. You must make sure you don't identify yourself with idols. Stay away from those things and you will be fine. Now, the thing that will normally cause the question, you know, some of the things, if, uh, for the casual study, uh, uh, reader of the Bible, you begin to wonder, what is all this hoopla about this issue of uh, circumcised or no circumcised? What is the trouble? I mean, why is it so important? Why is it so important that Paul the Apostle will argue with some people until their face will turn blue and they will decide to go to Jerusalem? Why is it necessary that you have to gather the whole council of elders in, in Jerusalem just to look at this issue, circumcise, obey the law of Moses? What's wrong with that? Why don't you just say, okay, if you like, do it. If you don't like, don't do it. Why, what is so important? Why is it so important that the council of air, the council of Jerusalem had to write a letter to the churches to tell them, we are not requiring you to do this. Why is it important that this kind of issue must be resolved? My brothers and sisters, the reason why it is important is because the souls of men are involved. When the Lord God Almighty gave his instruction for us to be saved, he understood that salvation is not by what you do. Is by what God has done for you. So the souls of men are involved. That is why it is very, very important. Number two, it is important because of the eternal destinies of souls is at stake. When you tell people that the only way they should be saved is when they do certain things. If they do those certain things and they have no relationship with the Almighty God, they will have this idea that they are saved when they are not yet saved. They will have this idea that they are going to heaven when they have not even started the journey. That was why Paul the Apostle is trying to say, do not give these people a false security. Do not give these people a false assurance that when they do X, Y, and Z, they will be acceptable unto God. He said, no, the only way you are acceptable unto God is by faith in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So number one, it is important because the souls of men are involved. Number two, it is important because their eternal destinies are stake. Number three, it is important because it deals with the integrity of the message of the cross. The message of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. In other words, if you preach the true word of God, you get people saved. If you don't preach the true word of God, people think that they are saved, but they are not. Because it is the truth of the word of God that sets us free. 
Why is it important? It is important because if you do, if you immediately you start messing with the integrity of the word of God, you will find out that the people of God are no longer able to walk with God the way they are supposed to. Because you have introduced something else into it. And you know that what kills a man, in most cases, many of us fall in the uh, fall into the area of sin, not because we go into obvious sins. Okay? The what really makes us fall is the little things that look like truths, but they are actually errors. If they put right in front of us today something that we know is poisonous, many of us will not eat it, except, of course, if something is wrong with that person. Okay? But if nothing is wrong with you, you are a normal human being. If a poison is placed in front of you, you will not eat it. But if you put a little bit in something that is edible, that is, not, that, is not, uh, that is not fearful, it is very easy for those people to swallow it. And that's why Paul was really making a big deal out of this because these people were basically poisoning the water. They were basically poisoning the gospel, making people believe that they have to walk to be able to earn the salvation of the Almighty God. And, Jesus, and Paul the Apostle said, no, that is what Christ came to save you from, to save you from the dead works of the law. That was why it is very, very important. But beyond this particular reason, beyond this, uh, the source of men that are involved, beyond the destiny of the state, uh, the destiny of the of the of, of men that is at stake, beyond the integrity of the message, there is something else that this verse of the scripture makes us or brings to light. And what it brings to light in this verse of the scripture, in this chapter of the of the book of Acts, is the importance of recognizing the baggages that we all bring. At the point of our salvation. What am I talking about? There were some certain behaviors that you had. Before you became a Christian. Okay. Immediately you became a Christian. Those behaviors don't disappear. I hope you know that. They don't disappear. Your behavior still continues. The only thing is that your soul, your spirit is now born again. But your flesh is still very much alive. And that is why you continue to do certain behaviors. If you are used to telling lies, you will now be to begin to do. You don't tell obvious lies anymore. You start telling white lies. You start coloring it in such a way. If you have this sticky finger before, you don't become, you know, you don't steal things anyway. You just simply borrow them. You know? So you begin to find that there are some behavior that comes with you when you are born again. You have to. This verse of the scripture highlights the packages that we bring. And if you look at verse number five, open your Bibles to that particular chapter. Acts of the Top Apostles, chapter 15. Look at verse number five there. The Bible says that, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, understand, these were Pharisees before they became Christians, before they became born again. He said, some of the sects of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the laws of Moses. So you will see that these are the guys who are doing it. Why is it very important to know that? You will understand that some of the people who became Christians in the early days, they were Pharisees. Some of the people who became Christian at that time, they were circumcised. Some of the people who became Christian at that time, they were living their life, obeying the laws of Moses before they became Christians. It was part of their lifestyle. Prior to becoming Christian, as Jews, as, 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 as Pharisees, they were circumcised. They were living the laws of Moses. It defined their faith. It defined their relationship with the Almighty God. It defined them as individuals. That was what they do. They were Jews. Now they are Christians. And they have been taught all their life that they are the custodians of the word of God. That salvation came through the Jew. They have been told all that all their life. Now you are bringing Gentiles into it. And they know that they are the custodian. They want to make sure that the Gentiles, they look like them if they are going to go to the same heaven like them. It was a baggage that they brought along with them. And some of the Bible says that the born again Pharisees now wanted believers to be circumcised. They wanted believers to obey the laws of Moses. And these new believers wanted to introduce these two requirements because it was a carryover from their old lifestyle. It was a carryover from their old lifestyle. Now why is this important for us to understand what the Pharisees brought over? Number one, the reason why it is important is because it reminds you, it reminds me of the influence of our old life on our Christian faiths. And that is why you will notice that the habits that you struggled with before you became a Christian, there's a strong probability that it's the same habit you are struggling with now that you are a Christian. Look at it very well. 
The same thing that used to give you problem is the same thing you are going to have problem with when you are born again, when you are a Christian. So you find that there is an influence, there's a subtle influence of our old life upon our new life if we are not careful. Why is it important to understand what these Pharisees were doing? Number two is because the impact of your background is, you know, your, the, the, the impact of our background on our interpretation of scripture. Your background has a way of coloring the way you see the scriptures. Your background has a way of coloring the way you interpret the scripture. I have a relative who is, well, you, she can hear anything. I don't, that was way back there. I don't know what, I don't know how she, I don't know how she interpret. Uh, she, she reacts now. But we, in, the, in, in when we're growing up, if you preach anything, she can accept it. As soon as you preach on adultery and fornication, she will go ballistic. Why? You probably need to ask her. But the point I'm saying is that, the point I'm trying to say is that we interpret the impact of our background. Certain things in our lives interpret, it colors the way we interpret the scripture. It colors the way we look at the view, we have the view of God. If you have had, if you have, if you grew up under an abusive environment, where you have an authoritarian figure in your life, there is a strong tendency that when you are relating with God, it colors your view. If you have a permissive environment, you grew up in a permissive environment, it will interpret you the influence, the way you look at the scripture. So your background, the packages you brought to the kingdom, has a way of affecting the way you walk in the kingdom. That's why this verse of the scripture is important. Number three, why is it important for you to understand what, what the demands of this Pharisee? The reason is because the power of our old life affects our relationship with the Almighty God. You see it in the way you inter interact with your friends. There is something that we used to say back home. That a man that has, always, a man that has been beaten by a snake before, when he see a coiled rope, or you see a belt that falls on the ground, it becomes very jumpy. Why? Because it looks like a, it looks like a serpent also. It looks like a snake. So the idea is that our old life has a way of um, impacting our relationship with the Almighty God. So if you have had, if you if you have stayed in a relationship where you have been used or abused or have been treated badly, when you come into the church, you will have the same skepticism. When you have been in a very trusting environment, there's a strong tendency that you become trusting everywhere you go. The idea is that the power of our old life has an impact upon your relationship with the Almighty God. That is why, what is why you see these particular Pharisees insisting on a particular lifestyle that they were used for. And then finally, our unconscious bias towards the things that we claim to have left behind is very, very strong. In other words, the things that you think that you have left behind, those things that you think that you are no longer doing. Now I'm born again, everything is new. You forget that you are still a human being. You forget that somewhere in your subconscious, certain things are still sitting down there. If you don't take time and you don't put yourself daily, those unconscious bias will show itself in your relationship. They will show itself in the way you interpret the scripture. They will show yourself itself in the way you talk to other people, in the way you relate with the almighty God. So the reason why we need to understand what the Pharisees, the baggages the Pharisees brought to the table is because it reminds us of the baggages that we also bring to the table when we come to the saving faiths. So this chapter therefore reinforces the need for us, number one, to recognize those tendencies in your own life. To recognize those tendencies in my life. What are my tendencies? What are the things that I uphold? What are the things that I consider to be important? What are the things that I emphasize to the detriment of other things? Those are the things that are reflective of what has gone, by, gone, gone on in my background. All the packages that I bring into the kingdom. It is, it is very, very important for us to understand what's going on in this chapter because we need, if we don't want to repeat the mistakes of these Pharisees, we need to purge ourselves and say, Lord, purge me of every old baggages so that I do not interfere with my work with you. And then finally, we need to examine ourselves continually in the word of God to make sure that we are still standing, to make sure that the things that we, the things that we say we have left behind, they remain in our background. Now, while the group from Jerusalem were very, very sincere, these preachers, they were sincere. They were recognized. They were given audience in the church. While they were sincere in preaching the gospel, Bible makes us understand that they were teaching error. That was as a result of their own roots. While they were sincere in putting, you know, while they were sincere, they were also putting a lot of roadblocks. In the path of other people. Because they were saying that you have to obey the laws of Moses. There are people who will not want to obey the laws of Moses. And therefore this door salvation will be closed unto them. Not only that. While these people were 
While these people were very, very sincere in their preaching, they were also unconsciously creating a new burden for the new people who were coming. And we see that in our churches today. We see that in the life of believers. There are certain believers, if you look in a certain way, you cannot walk. They don't consider you to be a Christian. If you look in a certain way, they believe that you are not born again. If you behave in a certain way, they believe. If you are a happy person, they believe that you are not supposed to be happy as a Christian. That is the unconscious bias that they bring from their old background and they are using against us. And the Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse number 5, it tells us, it says, examine yourself whether you are in the faith. In other words, look at your own life. Make sure that you are not bringing in any unnecessary baggage that will hinder other people from walking with your almighty God. I want you to stop for a second and just imagine with me. Can you imagine if Paul the Apostle had not stopped those people from preaching those things? If Paul the Apostle had not told them that what they are preaching is wrong. If he had not stopped them to say that you are adding to the gospel. What do you think would have happened? Nobody would have challenged them. These people, these young people, these Gentile Christians, they would have swallowed those particular things that they have been taught. They would have received those particular additions as part of the gospel. And before you know what's happening, these people would have created a pseudo kind of gospel. They would have created a new set of Christians. The Christians who have accepted Jesus, but at the same time walking according to the laws of Moses. They would have created a circumcision brand of Christianity. They would have impeded the propagation of the word of God. They would have discouraged the heart of new believers. They would have strengthen the hands of hell because the devil will not allow people to believe it and before you know what's happening they would have stopped the progress of the preaching of the word of God but because they were stopped the bible makes us understand that the gospel spread to all corners of the world the question this evening is this how do you recognize and stop those kind of error if they are flowing from the pulpit? How do you recognize? Thank God for men like Paul. Thank God for men like Barnabas who were able to recognize these people that they were preaching error. The question is, if you find yourself in that kind of environment, if you find yourself exposed to somebody who is mixing the truth, mixing a little bit of error with the truth, how do you recognize it and how do you do it and how do you deal with it? Bible tells in the book of John chapter 8, reading from verse number 31, it says, Jesus said unto the Jews who believed him, he said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Verse number 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have, no, and we have, no, and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be free? If you continue to read that verse, Jesus Christ continues to engage them in their conversation. But the part that I want you to understand, the Bible says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The only way you can recognize the error from the pulpit, the only way you can stop error from the pulpit is number one, when you know the truth of the word of God. You cannot stop it when you cannot even recognize it in the first place. You cannot recognize it if you don't even know what it is in the first place. So the first thing you have to do, the Bible says in verse number 31, if you are going to stop, if you are going to identify and stop error that flows from the pulpit, the first thing you have to abide in the word of God. Verse number 31 of John chapter 8 tells us, he said, then Jesus said to the Jews who believe in him, he said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You have to be abiding in the word. In other words, you know what the Bible says about the Bible. Know what it says about the truth of what you believe. Know what it says about the Savior that you believe. Know what it says about your work with the Almighty God. Know the Word. Abide in the Word of God. That is the only way you can recognize and be able to stand against the error that flew from the pulpits. Number two, how do you do it? Not just abide in the Word. You know the truth. Look at verse number 32. He said, you shall know the truth. And then the truth will do what for you? It will set you free. It will break the yoke of lie. It will break the yoke of deception. It will break the yoke of false teaching in your life. You have to first of all abide in the word of God. Then you know the truth. And then number three is that you surrender to that particular truth. Because if you do not surrender in that particular truth, what you find, and you keep arguing with every word of God, you keep arguing with every doctrine of the word of God, you will find out that the word will not do you any good. You know the truth. That is when the truth will set you free. And then number three, or number four, you measure your life against that particular word. 
The man who is going to be able to stand against the word of God, stand against the error that comes in our age. The man who is able to be able to say, okay, I recognize this error and I'm going to put a stop to it. Is a man who have taken that word and let the word transform him. Is a man that lives or measures his life against the truth of the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse number 12 tells us, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they are measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves by themselves. He said they are not wise. In other words, if I say I am better than my sister there because I don't do X, Y, and Z. Or I am better than my brother because I don't do X, X, Y, and Z. Then I am a fool. Because my brother or my sister is not the standard. The standard is the word of God. The standard is the Lord Jesus Christ. Compare yourself. Measure your life on the basis of the word of God. Then you can tell when somebody is going outside or when somebody is living a life that is outside of the word of God. Comparing. He said they that compare themselves. They that measure themselves with one another. He said they are not wise. So if you compare yourself with your standard of your pastor, you will get yourself in trouble. Because not everybody look good in the turtleneck and the jacket like this. But that is a story for another day. <laughs> so if you compare yourself with your pastor, you're in trouble. Okay? You have to take the word of God as the standard. I have said it here several times. If you take knife and cut this hand here, blood will come out. I'm a human being. Subject to making mistakes. Subject to misunderstanding things. And that is why we need to measure ourselves not with any living human being. Not with any other person. But we measure ourselves with the almighty God. Even in the Bible, the Bible makes us to understand that Peter himself, there was a time when he made a mistake and Paul had to call him out. That was a guy that ate with Jesus. That was a guy that walked with Jesus. If Peter can do that, oh boy, if you look at me, you're in trouble. <laughs> you are in trouble. So that's why we need to measure ourselves. Against the word of God. And then finally, you need to examine yourself daily. Examine yourself daily. Making sure. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 7 tells us. It says, examine yourself. Whether you be in the faith. Prove yourself. Know you not yourself. How Christ is in you. Except you are reprobate. In other words, know. Measure yourself. In the word of the almighty God. Examine yourself daily. Examine your thought. Examine your action. Examine the things you do. When you are doing that, when somebody comes and starts telling you cock and bull story from the pulpit, you can tell. Because you know that thing is not in the word of God. You know that that lifestyle is not supported by the word of God. They can come and tell you how beautiful psychology is or mix psychology with, with, some, with, some, with some scriptures and quote it as if it's the word of God. If you already know the word of God and you are abiding in the word of God and you are measuring yourself by the word of God and you are constantly examining yourself in the word of God, you will find that it's going to be very difficult for somebody to fool you. Very difficult. And Paul the apostle was that kind of a man. That was why he was able to recognize when those people came and they started teaching. And they started talking about those things. And Paul recognized because he knew that was not the truth of the word of God. He knew that was not the way Christ wanted us to live. He knew that was not the burden that they were supposed to put on believers. And because he knew that, he was able to challenge them. The question is, if somebody were to occupy this pulpit today and they are telling you what is not in the scripture, will we be able to recognize it? If somebody were to come and tell us today another gospel, we will we be positioned? Are we positioned enough? Or are we equipped enough to be able to recognize the error that is going on in the world right now? Are we able to stand in a position where we are able to say that, yes, I know because I have examined this thing in the word of God and I found it to be wanted. Are we positioned to do that? Because if we are not, what we find is that we make ourselves pray in the hands of people who are willing to take advantage of of the Christian faith. And there are many of them out there. Many of them out there. But the, pray, the, 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 the desires of the Almighty God. Is what I read to you in the book of John chapter 8. He said you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. 